Hello everyone, my name is Pixelrifts, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today I'm excited. We are going to take on the Ender Dragon tomorrow, and we need to do a little bit of preparation before we do. It's our first time taking on the dragon. We need to make sure we are fully prepared for the encounter, and there are a bunch of things to take into consideration. So today's episode is going to be gearing up to take on the Ender Dragon, which might require us to not sleep for a few days because we need to do a little bit of potion brewing and for the ingredients we need to brew the potions I'm looking for we need to take advantage of the phantom the minecraft mob that shows up after you haven't slept in a bed for a few days and we'll go exactly into the phantoms spawning conditions but the phantoms will drop phantom membrane which is the ingredient we need for slow falling potions which can be incredibly useful in a dragon fight because the dragon has a tendency to fly towards the player knock you up into the air pretty high and then when you fall if you don't have feather falling on your boots which i do but even then it might not be enough to save us from a fall from a great height it can lead to you going splat pretty quickly. So we're going to look for some phantoms in today's episode. We should be able to have them spawn around here. We're going to get hold of a bunch of phantom membrane. We're going to brew up some slow falling potions and that is just one ingredient in the kits we're going to be taking to the dragon fight. So we're going to be stocking our ender chest with the stuff that we will need to take on the dragon in ideal circumstances. I'm also going to craft myself some more eyes of ender and it's fine if we make more than we need because we can always craft those into a variety of other things namely ender chests and there's maybe a couple of other things we can do with eyes of ender a little bit later on we're going to bring the totem of undying with us we probably won't need it but it's always good to have one handy the name tags the golden apple stuff like that we're probably not going to worry about bringing with us and i think we can probably skip out on the obsidian and glowstone as well the enchanted golden apple is going to stay in there just because i don't want to risk losing it in whatever way i might end up losing it so we'll keep that in there but the rest of the glass bottles that i've crafted for potion brewing can actually go in here as well well, because one of the dragon's attacks is dragon's breath, which it can shoot at the player as a projectile, or it will just breathe out a bunch of it when it's sat on the bedrock portal in the center of the end island. So what we're going to do is bring a bunch of glass bottles so we can collect up the dragon's breath as we go. That's not only a valuable item for potion brewing, it's also a way of dispersing the dragon's breath so we don't take damage from it, because it's effectively like standing in a cloud of potion of harming. While I'm down here in the basement, I'm also going to grab some of the bamboo that we've got here and add to the pile of scaffolding that I've got in my inventory. I've been working on building a little bit of stuff around here and so I've had the scaffolding on me anyway, but I think a couple of stacks of scaffolding is going to be worth bringing with us to the end dimension. We will have towers to climb, we will have high places to reach, there's all sorts of stuff that scaffolding could be useful for, so I think we're going to stash a couple of stacks of scaffolding here in the ender chest. Okay, this is the end of night one. No phantoms right now, because phantoms will wait for three days with no sleep before they will start spawning on the fourth night so we need to make sure that we don't sleep for the next couple of nights as well but I'm fairly certain I slept the last night I was logged into the world so we'll start counting from now. One of the next things I'm going to grab to bring with us to the end is some wood and I've been farming both dark oak logs and spruce logs in plentiful supply. We're probably going to bring about four stacks of spruce logs with us in the ender chest and most of the time people will bring cobblestone they'll bring something that stands out in the end dimension which is a desolate place full of blocks that have a kind of lighter hue like this and then the void basically all around you which is just like the darkness of space kind of a little bit like the night sky except add a little bit more purple and some radio static to it but a lot of people will bring cobblestone because it stands out or because they have a large amount of it personally i have a large amount of wood and the advantage of wood is that we can craft it down into planks and then from there we can craft that into slabs and it's like we've brought eight times the amount of material with us because once we've defeated the dragon in the end dimension we're going to be going out beyond the central island where the dragon lives to the outer islands of the end and from there we'll need to do a lot of bridging the islands exist in clusters but look at the clouds up here as an example they're kind of broken up like the clouds are really and we'll need to bridge from one to the other using some sort of material we could of course harvest those materials from the blocks around us but end stone that comprises most of the islands is kind of slow to break and so even though we'll bring a couple of very durable pickaxes with us I still think it's a good idea to bring some bridging material with you that way you don't have to spend a bunch of time mining up material while you're out there 
Since we'll be spending a couple of nights without sleeping here in the overworld, I'm going to spend a bit more time gathering a few mob drops, because you might remember when we did the netherite episode, I turned all of the gunpowder that I had into TNT, and so I need to harvest a little bit more gunpowder from creepers, because we will need to craft ourselves some fireworks. After we've defeated the dragon and gone out to the outer end islands, our main objective is going to be locating end cities, and it is there where one of the most valuable items in the game game exists, we need to get hold of Elytra, which are Minecraft's wings, a way of flying around the world, and frankly they're one of the most game-changing items that was ever added to Minecraft. But in order to get some propulsion when we're flying around on these wings, we need fireworks, and so we're going to be crafting a few fireworks today thanks to the gunpowder left behind by these creepers. Naturally I'm trying to melee kill all of these so we can take advantage of the looting effect on my sword, and if you don't have an infinity bow, it can help to prepare in terms of arrows as well, so fighting a bunch of the skeletons that spawn on this night won't be a bad idea either. And honestly, the Ender Dragon fight is one of the reasons I prefer using an Infinity Bow, because it means you don't have to worry about running out of arrows during the fight. The dragon is mostly airborne, although it can come down to perch on the central portal, which is when we'll deal a pretty hefty amount of damage. But there are also targets to hit on a bunch of pillars that surround the central island, and so I usually find that a bow and arrow is a good way of taking care of some of those. Honestly, if you're less confident with your abilities with a bow and arrow, now is definitely the time to practice. And it helps that this witch seems to have slowed down a bunch of the baby zombies with a potion of slowness. Once we got a decent amount of gunpowder from attacking those creepers, we can return to our sugarcane farm, create a bunch of paper, and combine the paper and gunpowder in our crafting interface to get some flight rockets. Now these are flight duration one. If you want to have slightly longer flight duration, simply increase the amount of gunpowder you add in during the crafting recipe. This will increase the amount of time you get propulsion for when you're using your elytra, so it can be useful to have a bunch of flight duration 3 rockets. However, I find flight duration 1 the most flexible and they use the least amount of gunpowder, so while we don't have an automatic gunpowder farm, it seems like a sensible thing to have. Crafting all of those into fireworks gets us over a stack. We've got more than a stack and a half there, so I think we should be okay just stashing these in the ender chest. Now, having fought the dragon a number of times in previous worlds, I'm not really that scared of the dragon fight anymore. It can seem intimidating at first, but once you know the routine the dragon has, once you know its attack patterns and the way it behaves, it's usually pretty predictable. One thing I often find unpredictable is Enderman, because the central island of the end and the islands that form the ring around the central island are pretty much entirely occupied by Endermen. They are the other main inhabitants of the End, and you'll find a bunch of them spawning around the area where you're going to fight the dragon. This means, of course, that in the chaos of the dragon fight, when you are running around, you have a chance of looking at Endermen occasionally, and that can prove fatal. Dealing with the Endermen trying to attack you, trying to defend yourself against them, while also dealing with what the dragon is doing can be a very, very difficult thing to manage. And so some players opt to take a carved pumpkin to the End with them because a carved pumpkin can be worn on your head as a deterrent to Enderman. The only problem is it makes this overlay appear on top of the screen. It won't be there when you're in third person, but in first person, when you're supposed to be reacting to the dragon fight happening, it can prove a little bit difficult to handle. You lose some areas of your vision, it's very restrictive in terms of what you can see in your periphery, and when you're trying to keep track of where the dragon is so you don't get attacked by it, it can be a little bit difficult to handle. However, it is a surefire way of guaranteeing that Endermen won't attack you unless you physically attack them first. Something about the pumpkin being on your head makes the Enderman not recognize that you're looking directly at them, and it's safe to look at an Enderman even in the overworld or the nether when you've got a pumpkin on your head like this. Pressing F1 to remove the HUD can get rid of that pumpkin overlay entirely, but of course it hides the hotbar as well, so if I switch to my bow here for example, there is no indication that I've done that unless I draw back and fire an arrow. And oh goodness me, I almost hit Viola. <laughs> Thank goodness that bed was in the way. I think that may have saved Viola from a, a horrible and fiery death. In place of removing your HUD entirely, some players like to download a resource pack with a texture that basically changes the way the carved pumpkin overlay looks, often removing it entirely, sometimes just fading things out a little bit so it's more transparent and you can see through more of it, keeping the pumpkin effect while allowing you to see more 
during the dragon fight, and that will still guarantee that the Endermen don't act aggressive towards you. Personally, I'm practiced enough at not looking at Endermen that for the most part I don't rely on that, but it has tripped me up in the past, so we're going to bring a carved pumpkin with us regardless. Now it is worth noting that putting on a carved pumpkin while an Enderman is already attacking you won't save you, the Enderman won't de-aggro if you put the carved pumpkin on halfway through a fight, but it's going to be much easier to handle huge crowds of Endermen and not look at all of them in the process. While we're waiting for the sun to set a second time, I'm going to put my helmet on and wander over to the Savannah Village because I'm going to trade a little bit more with the farmer over there to get myself some more food. We're going to need a bunch of food for our trip through the end and I'm still relying on golden carrots as a pretty decent source of saturation so I don't have to eat as frequently on my travels. We're going to have to trade pretty quickly while we're here because I don't want the sun to go down while I'm still here at the village but I've got enough emeralds now that I should be able to find the farmer wherever he's got to. Here he is, center of the village, salt of the earth and of course the golden carrot trade is locked so <laughs> I think I might have to come back tomorrow. Alternatively I guess I could just craft my own golden carrots for once seeing as I have a pretty plentiful supply of carrots both here and back at my base. Yeah, I've got enough gold that I think at this point I should probably craft my own. <laughs> Night two of gunpowder farming and ranged combat practice can begin. And with all the zombies now burning in the sun, I think we're going to head back to the village after all. Because not only are we able to buy all of those golden carrots from the farmer, but we can also buy an unbreaking three book from this librarian. And if our mending guy is around, we'll buy a mending book here as well. Add a few extra golden carrots for luck and a little bit extra XP for our tools. So the reason behind the unbreaking and mending books is for when we get hold of the elytra and of course my anvil has just broke so I'll need to make another one. In fact I'm going to make two. One of which we're going to replace in our enchanting setup and the other of which is going to go alongside the unbreaking and mending book in our ender chest. Because you see elytra, the wings I was talking about earlier, have durability which means they can break and trust me if you are flying around above the void where there is nothing to do but fall then you don't really want your wings breaking on you so a lot of players will opt to take an unbreaking and mending book and an anvil to the end with them that way when they encounter their first elytra they can put unbreaking and mending on it right away. I'm also going to grab a bunch of coal for some torches we have a ton of sticks in my inventory I've been doing a bit of tree farming and I'm going to bring a bunch of torches with me we'll bring a stack on us just because it's always nice to have a stack of torches on you, and we'll bring a bunch more for the ender chest as well. We could, of course, save space in here by just turning the logs that we're bringing with us into the sticks and maybe even charcoal if we wanted to, but we've got a bit of space in the ender chest right now. We might as well add it in here. And before gunpowder farming night three begins, I want to stress the importance of having a bucket of water on you for this fight. Because if you've got a bucket of water, it can really save your bacon in a number of ways. First of all, if you don't have the luxury of slow falling potions and you want to avoid taking full damage, you can place a water bucket right before you land. And if you've practiced that technique, you should be able to just drop from a great height, land in a water source that you've just placed at your feet and take no fall damage. Now that's not a guarantee, of course. There are occasional glitches that can cause water buckets to not place correctly and that technique is enormously dependent on timing. But the other thing a water bucket will allow you to avoid is Enderman because if you place a water source like this and it pools out around you, you can stand in it without fear of Enderman attacking you since Enderman avoid contact with water. They'll just be left on the fringes of this giant puddle of water allowing you to swipe your sword at their legs and hopefully defend yourself from what could be a fatal attack. Gunpowder farming night number three has begun, but it is the new moon. And did you know the phases of the moon are actually related to Minecraft's difficulty system? This also affects whether or not slimes spawn in swamp biomes. If it's a new moon, you won't find any slimes spawning at all, which, believe me, has tripped me up a couple of times in the past. There is, however, an enderman over here, so I can aggro him and demonstrate the water bucket technique over here on this area of sand. The enderman's going to warp over here in a second, or he's just going to walk his way over here, and as you can see he is kept on the fringes of this area by the water. He's not going to try and walk into the water. If he does, he's going to take a little bit of damage and he's going to immediately teleport away as they do when they take damage. So we can use that to keep him away a little bit 
and make sure that we can take him out without taking any serious damage ourselves. We also get a couple more ender pearls from that, which is quite useful because we'll need those for traveling a little bit once we're out in the end. There's another enderman over here on the ridge, so I'm going to demonstrate the carved pumpkin very briefly as well. And it's worth noting that you can't right click that from your hotbar onto your head. You will have to place it there manually. But now I can wander up to this enderman wherever he is. I'm going to have to try and look at him sideways a little bit, just hopping up and down this beach sideways. Or maybe I can do that in third person and watch the arrows just kind of fly past me. The amount of other mobs around here is actually making it kind of difficult for me to track down that enderman again. I've lost him. I think he wandered off into the woods in this direction. And there's a spider jockey right here, which is always a novelty. Yeah, you can tell from the amount of arrows in me right now that fighting in third person has never really been my jam. But in the chaos that just ensued, I did get a couple of solid looks at the enderman. And with the pumpkin on my head, he did not aggro on me. So it's worth remembering that that's an option. And honestly, it's a little bit easier in the end when all you have to worry about is the dragon and you're not being shot on all sides by skeletons. Now, this whole time I've been talking about stashing stuff in my ender chest, which we are, of course, going to continue to do once we reach the end. So it should go without saying at this point that if you're working with an ender chest, you will need to make sure you bring a silk touch pickaxe with you so that you can pick one up again. And there are even occasions out there in the end islands where we'll stumble upon ender chests that are part of the natural generation of the end cities, where we're going to find a bunch of loot and the elytra. But you can't always count on those, and so you're going to need to make sure you've got your silk touch pickaxe with you if you want to keep using your ender chest multiple times throughout your journey. I've just taken the pumpkin back out again because as you can see over here, or as we could see over here, there is an enderman. And right now, looking directly at him, he's kind of behind that birch tree. But if I'm looking more or less directly at where the enderman is right now, he can't see me at all. Whereas if I do this, immediately aggroed. So <laughs> we do need to jump in the water here and make sure we don't take too much extra damage. But I think that was a pretty straightforward demonstration of how useful it can be to wear a carved pumpkin. Pumpkins, when placed on your head like that, also have no durability. So it's not going to break at any point if you take damage. The pumpkin will last for as long as you do. So with a little bit more sugarcane turned into paper and a few more rockets crafted, that pretty much concludes our ender chest setup for our trip to the end with the exception of the potions of slow falling I mentioned. So I'm going to wait around for night four, where we should start to find phantoms spawning above our heads if we're here on the surface. Our fourth night is finally arriving. So here is a little bit of information about how phantom spawning works. Basically, phantoms can spawn in the night sky after you haven't slept for three nights. So on the fourth night, you'll find them spawning in the sky above you. And it doesn't really matter where you are. The area can be well lit. The area can be a mushroom biome where there are typically no mob spawns on the surface and yet phantoms will still spawn. The main conditions for them spawning are that you are on the surface above sea level, so above around Y63, and that you have no solid blocks above your head. They can spawn if you have glass blocks above your head, so if you're standing in a house that has a skylight, chances are you'll find phantoms spawning there as well. I'm pretty sure they can still spawn in the rain, although it has started raining and I was wondering when it was going to happen when I didn't end up sleeping. But as long as you're outside on the surface and above sea level, chances are you'll find phantoms spawning on that fourth night. And in my experience, they tend to spawn twice. They spawn around midnight and then they spawn a little bit before dawn, which is probably a better time to fight them if you're not that confident fighting phantoms yet, because they are undead mobs and they will burn in the sunlight in the same way that zombies and skeletons do. Since they are undead mobs, that means that the smite enchantment on a sword will deal a little bit more damage to them. I'm going to keep using my sharpness sword for now because it has looting, and I can't remember if my smite sword did or not, but either way, we're probably going to mostly end up attacking them with a bow because they are flying creatures. There we go, there is the trademark sound of phantom spawning, and a group of three will fly at us from the air. Now, the cool thing about phantoms is they're not all that bright. They tend to swoop down fairly slowly, and if we strafe a little bit, we can usually avoid them, give them a tap with the sword, and we'll end up taking out a couple of them to get phantom membrane. They'll make that swoop noise when they start to swoop down, and then they will turn and follow you, which means you can basically bait them around in a circle to take them out pretty easily. And with that, we got five phantom membrane, which is pretty good. We did have looting, and there is a chance for phantoms not to drop any phantom membrane, but with looting, it pretty much guarantees you're going to get one or two from each phantom. And now we've got hold of some of that phantom membrane. We could sleep for the night, just start brewing potions, clear up the rain, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm curious to see if any more phantoms are going to spawn, and if the rain clears up, you might get a better look at them, because I know YouTube compression is never all that kind 
kind when there's rain in a video. The other thing to keep in mind about phantom spawns is that with each night you continue to not sleep, your insomnia counter, the behind the scenes value that determines whether or not phantoms are going to spawn, goes up by one, and that increases both the likelihood of phantoms spawning and the number of phantoms that will spawn. So if you stay up for multiple nights in Minecraft, just beavering away at whatever project you're working on without sleeping and you return to the surface, chances are the next night you're going to have a bunch of phantoms spawning in the air above you. There we go, just before dawn, one more phantom has showed up and hopefully he'll be a little bit easier to see in the light of the sun. We won't get to notice him burning though because even though the sun is about to rise, the rain will keep it dim enough for the phantom to not take any damage from the sun. Same goes for zombies, skeletons, or anything else in the area. But that's another nice easy phantom membrane for us. Nope, you didn't drop one. Okay, fair enough. So as the day dawns and continues to rain outside, we can return to the basement here where our potion brewer is all set up. This potion will of course need a nether wart first, so we're gonna throw that in there for the minute. Once that's brewed up an awkward potion, we'll chuck in the phantom membrane and wait for that to process. And just to increase the duration here, we're gonna throw in some redstone. So the slow falling potions will default to to 1 minute and 30 seconds, 90 seconds total of slow falling as an effect, and the redstone is going to increase that to 4 minutes. With three of the potions brewed up, I'm going to stash two of them here in the ender chest, and we'll use the third to demonstrate the effects of slow falling here in the overworld. And I don't tend to rely on the effects of slow falling during the dragon fight, but it is a pretty useful thing to have in reserve. Because if I swig this potion of slow falling, it more or less does what it says on the tin. I float down from here, taking no fall damage as I land. I'm not even certain if I would trample the crops or not. And you'll notice a slightly kind of floaty sensation happens as you're dropping down, <laughs> there we go, between blocks because it will slow you down for even the first little section of a fall from one block to another. So you kind of feel like you're walking on air for a little while. Along with that floating sensation, you get a complete immunity to fall damage, although it doesn't necessarily counteract some of the things that the feather falling enchantment would, like damage from throwing an ender pearl. It does however mean that if you throw an ender pearl into a kind of awkward position, you're not going to have to worry about taking damage from the fall. We could turn these into splash potions of slow falling and just throw them on ourselves when we start the dragon fight, but honestly I find that if you're knocked up into the air by the dragon, having one of these around to swig is going to be a lot more straightforward than trying to throw the splash potion of slow falling on yourself in mid-air. We're going to tuck some of the phantom membrane in here with our potion ingredients, but I'm going to bring a couple of phantom membrane with us because we can demonstrate once we get elytra that phantom membrane is actually the material used to repair elytra if they don't have mending and unbreaking. But with my slow falling potion now pretty much worn off, that is where we're going to leave it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. I wanted the rain to wear off, but I think we are pretty prepared. I am itching to go to the stronghold and get that dragon fight accomplished. So that's what we're going to do in the next episode. Look forward to that. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.